Hey folks, welcome to the Artificial Life Advanced class. It's T-4 in the Artificial Life Creation Countdown. Uh, here is uh, the master spreadsheet. Uh, we are way behind, uh, uh, but I haven't given up. Um, there's a Slack built into the system, the stretch goal. We can dump that. There's the entire month of November that's not booked. We'll see how it goes. So the goals for this time, uh, diamond sequencer, that's the sequential machine that we're trying to make that'll control the whole reproduction process. It's supposed to have programs running, not even close. Uh, spike assembler and loader, the, the you know, a prototype of something that's gonna actually take the program code that's gonna exist and put it in and get it de deployed onto uh, a, a diamond. Made some progress on that. Take a look in the simulator. So, just going to try to set this up, get it going, and uh, some color commentary. All right, so first it's going to spread out. There it is. We have our diamond sequencer. This is our loader. This is uh, the new thing here. We've, one of the aspects of the loader that we have to deal with is that as it injects instructions, it has to be careful not to use up the last empty space. Let's see this first bit get as far as, uh, uh, all right, so there we are. Okay, boom, and now we're, now we're cooking. Uh, um, so the loader is now down here, and that's our primary aggravation bug at the moment is that the uh, loader doesn't stay in place, and it's the worst excuse for deterministic serial computation that one uh, is likely to encounter today. Uh, but we have deployed uh, a marker uh, uh, that has its special uh, label uh, that is in honor of me uh, for having gotten this far. And we've also deployed a Zong just to take up some space. The program that we're doing here, have we got the program, uh, is this. So there is our marker and it gets sucked into the label here as part of the first instruction. Here's a zong, another zong, and then finally we're gonna put in a reset instruction. So, so far we have a marker and one zong. All right, now we got a shapeshifter. It needs to find uh, available space. Oh, 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 it all happened. <laughs> it all happened already. Uh, uh. <laughs> That was just about the first time that I got this working this far. Uh, and you can see this this white one here and, and this black one here. Those those are loop killers uh, that are actually part of the execution of the reset instruction. So if things started to happen. I'll come back to that a little later. Uh, um, all right. Uh, uh, the bugs that... <laughs> <laughs> that thing is full of, uh, um, are not just because I'm old and uh, forgetful and not as good a programmer as I used to be. They also reflect a fundamental tension uh, uh, between trying to keep total control of everything and trying to just be all completely loosey-goosey. And, uh, you know, on the one hand, we, we normally think of control versus chaos as being like a binary distinction. So traditional computing, deterministic computing is top-down, rigid control. Nobody can do anything except when they're told to, and then they must do it. Uh, uh, authoritarian uh, social uh, uh, societies try to do the same thing, and it never works. And of course, the problem is, is that top-down control and like deterministic computers, it works for small systems. So people think they build a small system and say, hey, it works, but the whole point is top-down control doesn't scale up. On the other hand, people think that if you don't keep everybody completely in line, that if you let them have any freedom at all, you'll have chaos, you'll have anarchy, turbulence. Uh, uh, but what we're looking for is the space in between where we have resilient systems that consist of uh, robust agents that can survive on their own and then bottom up, they can make uh, co cooperatives to do things bigger than they could do on themselves. And so part of the essence of that is having this idea of slip joints, that things can interact without being rigidly connected. So one can slip and the other one won't go. And hopefully our diamond sequencer will partake of some of this resilience. Uh, we shall see. Uh, um, so, you know, the control aspect of diamond sequencer, you know, so here it is. It's, it's a modified form of the HG3 
three uh, grid, and it's got these four pockets around it, and the access to these four pockets that represents uh, input, output, temporary space, and the instruction stream, there's a lot of rules that you have to follow about going in and out of these pockets in order to get this reliable sequential stepping that we're trying to produce. On the other hand, uh, the pocket chains that are the things that are going to go in there, and like one of the rules is you can only have one code on one of these pocket chains in there at a time, uh, uh, they are loosely coupled to their neighbors. Like this EC here, it, it's not even lined up with the EC that is the next link in the chain because they don't have to be. They just have to point at the next pocket and the pocket then points back at them. And hopefully uh, when we have... <laughs> some gigantic mess like this so you can barely find the diamond sequencer buried in the middle of it uh, uh, that will be able to have this combination of control and quietness and reliability in the diamond sequence pockets the diamond sequencer pockets the dsps uh, while allowing whatever happens uh, out further in the grid uh, out further in the diamond we'll see how it goes to recap, the actual grid, we just saw the simulator on the grid uh, a couple of weeks ago. We had a crash storm. The underlying Linux stuff got messed up, uh, um, and it, it took the whole thing down. Uh, looking at it, there was a hypothesis that possibly in some extreme cases it might have run out of room in the Linux kernel buffers. So we said, let's up them by 400%, make them four times bigger, and start it up again. And that's been running now for several weeks, and it hasn't happened again. That proves nothing, but it's a little bit encouraging. And the question was, how is it going to end? I mean, how is a run on the grid going to end? Is it going to be another crash storm? Is it going to be a power outage? Uh, if the if, uh, if I lose power to the house for a half an hour or so, the UPS is going to die and the grid is gone. Uh, you know, there's no backup for this. This is, this is live computation that's happening. It's not even clear what backing it up would mean. Uh, um, or the third possibility is that I will step in and end it, and that's what happened. I ended the previous run with no failures outside, and now it's running the spike loader, so let's just take a look at it for a minute. So that's just getting started. I'll run it for several more days anyway, unless, uh, you know, the code improves enough that I want to bump it off. Uh, yes, uh, I'm not going to recap all the previous T2 project worries, but I figure if there's new worries, I need to report them. There's a, some kind of issue with the camera and the USB connection to the laptop that's recording the grid. This is a, a Minolta uh, uh, TX4 that uh, is recording all of this stuff and it, it flaked out and it flaked out when I was away from the grid and I lost five days of data. Now it was just let's play uh, guess which diamond grid is going to pop next so it's okay that we lost it but even after I got back and I, I unplugged the thing and plugged it in again it happened again. I had to power cycle the Fuji uh, completely and, and mess around with it so now I'm scared now I'm anxious that something's going to happen and when we actually matter like you know the grandchild of the ancestors about to be born we shall see uh all right i want to take a couple of minutes uh just before i'm not going to go long 
uh, uh, to talk a little bit more about sequential computing. And so, you know, last time I was showing this uh, picture from Wikipedia, I called it a traditional processor, really should call it a sequential processor, because that's absolutely the key to it. You know, yes, it computes a function, it's, it's got some, it takes some input, it produces some output, but the real key to it is this circular connection between the registers that go down to the combinational logic, the thing that actually can, you know, make nonlinear functions and add things and do whatever, and then writes it back into to the registers erasing what used to be there. That's the key, so that on the next step, we can bring in all the power of combinational logic to apply to the next step. Uh, um, and yes, you know, we, we, we take some input, and whenever we take it, we produce some output whenever we produce it. But that key of using the same piece of hardware over and over again on each of multiple steps is the absolute key to the power and the risk of sequential processing. Now, I'm going to take a lot of time on this, but you know these large language models that have these you know millions and billions of parameters, uh, uh, that they're fundamentally by their nature they're essentially combinational. Mostly that they just sort of feed forward. It depends on the exact model, uh, but you can make them into sequential by taking their own output and feeding it back in as more input. And people do that routinely. And people somebody found out that adding the phrase "Let's think step by step" uh, made uh, the pre-trained language model it wasn't trained for this particular task at all go from a clear fail to a you know a solid C plus <laughs> on some of these models and you know my interpretation is the reason it does that is because it uh, encourages the network to expect to do multiple passes through the whole thing. Well, first I need to do this and the answer is blah, and then I need to do this and the answer is blah, rather than trying to just intuit the answer in one pass through. And that is the key right there. That's the sequential computing, again, power and risk. Uh, uh, and, you know, the risk is, is, okay, what happens if you lose your place? If you just have a feed-forward network, if you just have combinational logic, it's inherently self-stabilizing. As soon as the inputs stop changing, well, then the stuff next to it stops changing, and the stuff next to it, it flows through until the output stops changing, and that's the answer that you want. Sequential logic cannot do that because it erased its intermediate results. So when you have a sequential computer, somewhere in it, you have to build a reset button. And so that's our title card for this time. You know, you look at all the devices you have in your life. Some of them have a reset button, some of them don't. That's the hallmark of the sequential machine. Reset. What's it doing? It's saying forget all the steps and go back to something where it considers a step one, where now, as long as we can do all these steps again, we'll get the answer that we had in mind. The diamond sequencer is a sequential computer, so we need the equivalent of a reset instruction for that as well. So that was the LX reset. LX, I'm saying, is a loop executable. I'm kind of using it to put at the front of my instructions. Uh, um, and I was working on the LX reset as much as I was working on the loader in the last period. Uh, uh, and there's a big question, a design question. You can't reset the entire universe because the universe is indefinitely scalable. And, you know, so in the end, I decided that what reset means is flush the output loop and flush the temporary loop and leave the input loop alone because presumably somebody else put something useful there. And then once the loops are gone, output in reg, uh, reseed them to a new one, and then move on to the next instruction. So uh, we, uh, we really don't have time to look at it. Uh, we, we can look, I got a demo. Well, what the hell, we'll try to do it really quick. Uh, 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 we do not have enough time, but I'm just going to do it anyway. So here it is. Here's the reset instruction, and I'm just going to give it an event. Oh, and it didn't work. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I guess, I guess we won't do it. We'll do it during the during the live stream. All right. So that is it. Uh, uh, the next update is going to be T minus uh, three. My goal, my primary goal, is to have some kind of program loading and running that copies itself. Uh, and you know, that's a big chunk of the missing hunk of of the project that we're trying to get to so we'll see if we can get that far but hopefully i feel like we're getting close and uh, we shall see how it goes have some fun as always and again uh after the next update there's going to be a pre-programmed hold in the countdown because the month of november is booked out uh have other stuff to happen no updates in november and then we'll be back in december for t-210 and hopefully we'll have grandchildren for the ancestor 
on January 3rd. Thank you so much for coming and taking a look. Uh, uh, I hope to see you next time.